I'll just give people sort of a, a quick introduction on me, which is that I'm originally from London, Ontario. I grew up with my dad in the investment industry. So I always kind of, you know, I grew up around stocks and bonds. Uh, I studied economics and philosophy out in Halifax um, for my undergrad. And I was always kind of the weirdo in each of those faculties. Um, really, I started asking a lot of questions about the economic system. Things weren't sort of sitting well with me. Uh, and it wasn't until my third year, I got accepted to do an exchange to New Zealand. And that's where I learned about this concept of triple bottom line economics for the first time. Um, and instead of just looking at profit, looking at people, planet, and profit. And light bulbs really started going off in my head, realized that the issue with our economic system is that it was completely ignoring social and environmental uh, uh, aspects. And so, you know, really came back to my fourth year of economics full of questions and my profs didn't really have answers for me. Uh, so I went to Sweden and I did my master's in sustainability. Uh, I did my thesis focused on this topic of sustainable investing, um, graduated in July of 2008, came back to Canada ready to take the investment world by storm. And in October of 2008, I don't know if people remember, uh, but we had a giant financial crash. So needless to say, uh, you know, my job prospects weren't great. Uh, sustainability really got thrown on the back burner. That's when I started my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been trying different things, different business models. Uh, for a little while, I taught uh, economics at Sheridan College. So intro to micro, intro to macro economics, and I would sort of sneak in sustainability wherever I could. Uh, I started my blog in, I think, 2012, sometime around then, uh, sustainableeconomist.com, just started writing things um, and started researching, you know, the different options that were available for people uh, to, to do sustainable investments. And, and so many people started reaching out to me saying, Tim, I love what you're talking about, but how do I actually do this? Um, so uh, that's when I started working with people one on one. And then in 2018, I kind of took the plunge. I stopped teaching, went full time, uh, got my CFP designation. I'm a certified financial planner and uh, launched my sort of company, Good Investing. And really, for the last five years, have been full time helping people figure out their personal finances, but through this lens of sustainability. So I want to be clear I'm not like a manager or a broker. I never touch touch my client's money. I'm more like a coach or a consultant, and I teach people how to do this. Um, and so really excited to be able to present uh, uh, to you today, basically a sort of overview of sustainable banking, sustainable investing, and really trying to make it as much as possible, sort of some practical examples of what this actually looks like. I find sometimes we can get caught in the theoretical piece a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one moment here just to do get this going. Um, if I share my screen and then I can share this and then I'm going to click present and then present and fingers crossed, this looks good. Uh, I can no longer see the chat. So again, if you have questions, please like throw them in the comment. Would love to know who you are, where you're from, kind of what brought you here. As I go through this, if there are things that you really like, you know, if there are things you don't agree with or you want to dig in further, by all means, you know, please, please, please use that chat. Um, but I will sort of jump into the formal presentation now. So, I want to start with some of my own acknowledgements just as a starting place for this is that, you know, really want to communicate that anytime we're talking about investing, that it does come with a high degree of privilege. Obviously, it means that we've got enough money such that we are able to invest, that our revenues, our income every month exceeds our expenses. You know, we've got a surplus that we're able to invest. Not everybody uh, is in that position. A lot of people, especially right now with inflation and, you know, stagnant wage growth, a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, just really want to acknowledge that, that, you know, uh, uh, really, that if we are even just talking about investing our money, it means that we've got enough to get by. And there is some privilege with that. Uh, as well, I want to be clear, sustainable investing is not a panacea. This is not a silver bullet. You know, this isn't something that can replace, you know, pushing governments or, you know, other forms of activism, that this is sort of another tool in our toolkit that we can use to be able to advance a more sustainable economy. Um, but I want to be clear that, you know, really, I, I still want you taking all other types of actions. You know, I want you, you know, uh, uh, eating less meat and flying less. And, you know, there are so many things that we can do using our political power to uh, to vote 
vote and uh, uh, elect uh, re representatives of government that are going to push forward on these things, but that this is sort of another tool for you to be able to consider. Um, I also want to, I love kind of giving my sort of big picture overview of the economy. This is an image from a mentor of mine, Hazel Henderson. Um, you know, she's just uh, an absolute legend. Sadly, she passed a couple of years ago, but she's been working on this idea of uh, sustainable economics for a very long time. This is an image published in 1982, which is the year I was born. So, you know, she, a lot of the work that I'm doing is very much sort of standing on the shoulders of, of those who came before me. Um, she uses this image of a cake, which I love. There are going to be lots of pie charts that we're going to look at, right? So I figured I'd start you off with a cake chart. Um, really, when we talk about the economy, you know, I want to be clear that there's so much more than just the investment sector, that really this bottom layer of the cake, you know, this rich uh, soil, you know, dark chocolate layer that is Mother Nature. Without Mother Nature, there is no economy without uh, clean air, clean water, the ability to grow food, you know, nothing else exists. Uh, on top of that, we have the love economy. This is all of the unpaid labor that our, our, our economy actually depends on. You know, raising children, right, is just such this incredible act of service that we do. Um, but also in terms of this love economy would be things like caring for our elderly, and it would be all of the volunteering that we do. You know, remember when it comes to our economy, it only measures the things that have a price attached to it. So there's all this activity that happens that doesn't have a price associated with it that we call the love economy that is just absolutely fundamental to our society. The rest of the economy could not exist without all of that unpaid labor. Uh, we also do have the underground economy. So this would be sort of the black market, you know, and, and kind of things where there is prices, but it's not sort of official that that certainly exists. Um, and all of these are what we call sort of non-monetized. These are not captured by our economic measures of growth. You can see here, you know, these sectors are what are called GNP monetized, uh, gross national product. This has sort of evolved in the past decades. We now call this GDP, gross domestic product. So when it comes to GDP, we're really only measuring the public sector and the private sector. Again, the public sector is going to be all of government spending. So uh, our roads and our schools and our hospitals and our judicial system and all all of these things that the economy would not be able to function without all of these things, right? Again, you know, uh, uh, often gets ignored or gets labeled as sort of a cost rather than an investment. And that so much of our attention, when you look at the business uh, section of the news or, you know, you watch uh, the nightly news and they talk about the economy, so much of the conversation is focused on this private sector. This is really the icing on the cake. This is sort of that, you know, saccharine sweet, you know, really gets people giddy that so much attention is, is really uh, uh, given to this private sector. And then specifically, like even this, you know, most of this is small businesses. The stock market is just really a small layer at the top of this cake, but none of this would exist without these other layers of the cake. So it's really important context. I just want to kind of reframe people's thinking about the economy, that understanding that it is so much more than just the private sector, but obviously we are talking about investing today. So I am gonna be very, very focused on this private sector. As well, from an individual standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm really going to be focusing on, you know, savings and investing today. This is really the focus of what we're talking about. Uh, I want to be clear that everyone is sort of on their own financial journey, that financial literacy is such an important thing. Um, there are lots of different things that we can talk about when it comes to how you earn your money and the idea of working for a values aligned organization, uh, when it comes to spending our money and, you know, buying from local companies or companies that are leaders in sustainability. Borrowing is a huge topic, you know, always love talking to people about the idea of good debt versus bad debt and understanding how debt can be a bit of a trap and can kind of, you know, spiral us a little bit. So, you know, these are all really important things when it comes to financial literacy and, you know, on your sort of financial journey, things to consider. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're really going to be focused on saving uh, and then investing. Um, I'm happy to have questions about uh, all of these and, you know, certainly in the Q&A, you know, if, if, if people have questions about these areas, I'm so happy going there, but just want to be clear what I'm going to focus on today. Whew. So when it comes to saving your money, 
this is always kind of the first thing. So now I'm kind of making an assumption here that we have a surplus, you know, every month, or maybe we got a big bulk, you know, inheritance or big bunch of cash, but we have more money than we need right now that we are in the fortunate position of being able to set some aside for the future. Um, and so the first thing you want to think about when it comes to saving your money is this idea of an emergency fund, right? And this is nothing you know, special. This is nothing sustainable. This is just personal finance 101. But I want to be clear that you should never invest all of your money, that we always do want to have an emergency fund. For most families, we typically set up about three months to six months spending. So if you sort of look at your budget and add up your costs over an average month, you know, we want somewhere about three months to six months in cash. We want to take zero risk with this. So this is going to be in a, a high interest savings account. It's also going to be liquid. So we don't want it to be locked away. So I know a lot of people love these GICs, Guaranteed Investment Certificates, which are very good, which are low risk, but sometimes they're locked in for a year, for three years. We don't want that with our emergency fund. Really, this is this is sort of, you know, we used to talk about a parking lot for our cash. I like talking about a bike rack that we just want to have an account where the cash can just sit there and hopefully we never need to use it. But when life happens, when something happens, you know, it's so nice to know that you've got that safety net of three to six months spending just sitting there in cash in a high interest savings account. Um, when it comes to the sustainable part of this, really, it's about understanding the difference between banks versus credit unions. Uh, the credit unions are just awesome. Credit unions are amazing. I love credit unions. But when it comes to an emergency fund, I can't tell you how many people just have their, their emergency fund sitting in like a checking account at the bank. And that's just like a terrible place to keep it um, really for two reasons. There's sort of a financial reason, which is that if it's in a checking account, you're earning basically 0%. So we do want to have it in a savings account where we can at least earn something. You know, a lot of these high interest savings accounts right now, you can earn about 3% to 3.5%, right? So at least, you know, from a financial standpoint, please, let's keep our emergency fund somewhere where it's earning at least something. And then from an ethical perspective, it really is about understanding how amazing credit unions are and really how much better they are than the banks. Um, you know, I, I did a blog post on this way back when. Um, this is sort of my, you know, short summary of it. I could talk about this topic for so long, but really it's about understanding that number one, credit unions are not driven by profit. Banks are. So banks have something called a fiduciary duty to maximize profits. And the way they do that is by essentially gouging their customers. There are a lot of different ways they do it, but one of the ways they do it is by paying you almost no interest on your deposits, is by, you know, dinging you with those fees, right? So really that is their mission. Whereas credit unions aren't driven by profit, they're co-ops, it's cooperative banking. So their mission is to maximize the, the user experience, the membership benefits that they want us to succeed. So really, you know, just at the top sort of motivation, credit unions are so much more aligned than banks are. Uh, they also have a much more democratic governance structure. So with banks, they're publicly traded. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about this idea of shareholder engagement that as shareholders, we get to vote our shares. But with banks, it's one share, one vote, meaning that the more shares you own, right, the richer you are, the more voice you have in terms of how these banks are governed. Whereas with credit unions, it's much more democratic. It's one member, one vote, right? So that really it gives us, it doesn't matter how much money you've got, each member has the same vote. Uh, the last thing is about helping your local economy. Obviously keeping the money locally is great. This one is a little bit of a rabbit hole. I'm just gonna to touch on it. I can go deeper later if we want, but it's really about understanding that banks and credit unions both operate using something we called fractional reserve banking. It's a bit of a sort of technical term there, but what it means is that, you know, we know that when we put our deposits at a bank or credit union, that they don't keep all the money in the vault, right? That they keep some of it in the vault and then they loan out the rest of it. Well, what's interesting is that when we actually look at how it's done, it goes a little bit further than that because banks and credit unions have this unique ability to be able to create debt. So actually they do keep our full deposit in the vault, 
but because it's in the vault, they can use that to create a multiple amount of debt. And really the, the ratio that we were used to this tends to be about 19 to one, that, that really for every thousand dollars of deposits that you have in your bank or in your credit union, they can create $19,000 worth of debt. And this is again, a big topic. I've done a lot of, you know, this used to be a whole lecture about how the banking system works and fractional reserve banking, right? But just understand that banks take your deposits and they use it to create debt. Now, when we hold our money at a bank, if I'm holding $1,000 at RBC, well, RBC is going to take my $1,000. They're going to use it to create $19,000 worth of debt. But who does RBC loan money to? RBC's clients are overwhelmingly large, publicly traded corporations. We're talking about pipelines. We're talking about tire sands. We're talking about mining projects that they are going to take my deposits and use that to loan out money for these large projects. That's just how it works. Whereas with credit unions, it's different. Credit unions don't loan money to large corporations. The members, the, the, the companies and the individuals that are credit union members are people from your community. And the debt that credit unions issue are mortgages and small business loans, overwhelmingly. Which means that my $1,000 at the credit union, they're still using that $1,000 to create $19,000 worth of debt. It's still the same system there, but they're loaning it to members of my community, small business loans and mortgages. So when I keep my deposits at a credit union, I really am helping my local economy. I'm basically facilitating the credit union to be able to issue those debts, to, to, to create those mortgages, to be able to provide those small business loans to other credit union members. So credit unions really are awesome. They are absolutely incredible. Uh, I know For Our Kids has this wonderful toolkit that I spent a whole bunch of time, you know, looking at. So maybe, I don't know if we can like provide a link to the, the, the toolkit in the chat, but we you know, did. I know there is a list. Yay. Uh, there is a list of credit unions, um, you know, and they've got it organized based on region and different things. Um, you know, so really it's about understanding again, when it comes to your saving, you can always just start with an emergency fund, sort of where you keep the bulk of your money, but ideally also moving over our checking and savings accounts, you know, any, any of our bank accounts that we've got, you know, moving them from a bank to a credit union is going to have a huge, huge impact. Tim, I'm going to ask you a quick question while of we're course. on the credit union. So Stephanie has asked, if credit unions are not driven by profits, why are the rates at credit unions often not competitive? I've seen this time and again, and it's frustrating wanting to do business with them when rates, i.e. mortgage, high interest savings are not on par or better than big banks. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so again, there, there are different ways that they do it, okay? And I want to be clear, uh, you know, if we're talking about debt, like if we're talking about mortgages, um, you know, credit unions are, can be a little bit more limited, especially from a risk profile perspective that they don't do the risk analysis themselves, right? They're sort of, you know, have a third party that does that risk analysis with them sort of for them. So in terms of understanding that risk return piece, you know, especially on debt, you know, often that it, you know, it might not be as competitive, Again, the banks, they are going to have more economies of scale. They are much, much larger, right? And um, they also have the ability to take on a little bit more risk than credit unions. Uh, that said, you do need to shop around because sometimes the credit union does have the best rate. It really kind of depends. Uh, each individual is going to be different when it comes to mortgages. Uh, when it comes to fees, so, you know, really, to me, this is where credit unions really shine is that when uh, bank fees that, you know, we all know that sort of $10 a month, $12 a month, you know, that, that the banks charge us, there are a number of credit unions that don't have that. So, uh, for example, in Ontario, I'm a member of Duca, and Duca has free checking accounts. So one way where credit unions often do win is, you know, in terms of those monthly fees. 
Uh, when it comes to the rates, the interest rates, like it really varies. It really, you know, depends quite wildly. Again, you do need to shop around. And the credit unions, in my experience, for the high interest savings accounts, uh, there are some great resources. I could like show you a list and, and that a lot of credit unions are at the top or near the top in terms of those rates. So, you know, really understand that the business models are very, very similar. Um, the credit unions don't get to do a lot of the more lucrative activities that banks do. So when we think about a bank, they have different divisions. There's checking and savings, right? There's uh, insurance, uh, there's uh, debt, credit cards, but there's also corporate finance. There's also wealth management, right? Your investments. There are all of these different divisions within the bank. Really, when it comes to credit unions, they really only have the checking and savings. That's like what they do. Now, they have a little bit on the debt side, right? Not nearly as much as the banks, but a little bit on the debt side. Um, but the insurance, if you're buying insurance through a credit union, it's going to be through a third party. Credit cards, no credit union has like their own actual credit card. It's always through a th third party like Calabria or MBNA, which are owned by the banks. Um, and even their investments, credit unions, you know, they might have a, an advisor that's in the branch, but they're actually going to um, uh, uh, provide you with a third party mutual fund that they don't do the wealth management themselves. OK, so really, I want to be clear that with banks, you know, they have all of these different divisions with credit unions. We're really only getting very small slices of services. Um, and those are areas where the banks don't make like a huge amount of profit. Like they're not making a huge amount of money off of those ten dollar, twelve dollar a month fees. It's not bad. They'll take it. Right. But that's not where, you know, the bulk of their profits are coming from. So really, it is about understanding that competitive landscape, that credit unions have a much more narrow focus and narrowed in areas where, you know, might not be sort of quite as lucrative versus, you know, the banks really, you know, they want to get their teeth into you and then they want to sell you the whole range of products, right? Some of them are going to be more lucrative than others, but they're also going to have things like the wealth management, you know, where they have their own proprietary investment funds. They're going to have the corporate finance, which is all the consulting and the loaning and everything to the large corporations. You know, they do tend to be a lot more, I would say, multifaceted compared to credit unions, which are really quite simple and straightforward. We want to use them for checking and savings accounts. And then as well, you know, sometimes for mortgages and small business loans. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? One last so. question on credit unions. Yeah. How do you manage the possibility of a credit union failing? Uh, so you don't really have to worry about it too much. Uh, both credit unions and banks uh, have something called deposit insurance. Right. So this is something nobody ever thought about deposit insurance. And then a couple of weeks ago, there was the Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, uh, went under due to mismanagement. And all of a sudden, everyone was like, oh, my goodness, deposit insurance. Um, and so, you know, it's about understanding that. And actually, for credit unions, it's a little bit more generous. Uh, uh, banks are regulated federally. So they're covered by something called the um, FDIC, uh, uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC. And it's up to 100K per account. OK, so every account that you've got, and again, this is just deposits. This isn't investments. Investments are something different, but just checking and savings accounts that banks are covered up to $100,000 per account. Uh, credit unions are actually governed provincially, right? This is why, you know, I can't join a credit union in Manitoba. I can only join a credit union in Ontario. And so, you know, really, they are governed provincially. And the, each provincial, each province has their own insurance sort of scheme with like the FDIC, but for credit unions. And most provinces, it's up to 250k per account. Uh, what this means is that if you've got savings, you've got deposits at a credit union, if the credit union fails and goes bankrupt, you're insured by the government up to that 250k limit, right? I don't think anyone should have more than, you know, 250k inside of a checking or a savings account. If you've got that much money, please talk to me. There are more effective places for us to be able to put that much. So again, you know, this really is just for an emergency fund. And what it means is that if it goes bankrupt, that your money is covered. It's kind of a pain because you'd have to switch institutions and I'm uh, gonna have to find another you know, account and get that all set up. But it's certainly not the end of the world. 
if it goes bankrupt, um, because your money is covered by those provincial insurance uh, uh, programs. Does that make sense? Any other questions about credit unions? I love credit unions. They're so awesome. Uh, really, you know, I've got my action items here. Um, you know, feel free to jump in if there is another question. But, you know, really what it comes down to is, you know, I number one, I want you to set up an emergency fund. Everyone should have an emergency fund. This is a very, very important thing when it comes to personal finance. And, you know, really want to encourage people to switch to a credit union. Uh, I do have a blog that I can share about, you know, how to fire your bank where I kind of go through it step by step and you start by opening up the new account and you know moving all of your direct deposits over and you know setting up your bill payments and then you know probably want to leave your bank running for about 6 months just to make sure that you didn't miss anything right and then and then once you know there's really no activity in your bank at all um, you know, that's when you can snip the card and cut ties with them and move totally over to the credit union. Um, also want to, you know, just, just a couple myths about credit unions or barriers that I can break down. Number one is that ATMs, um, you know, with credit unions are actually part of this thing called the exchange network. So you can use any ATM from any uh, credit union, any national bank, and any HSBC uh, for free. So, you know, it's, you still get access to probably the same number of ATMs that you did before with your bank, depending where you live and where the branches are, it might be more convenient, it might be less convenient, but just know that you do get access to this huge network of free ATMs. Uh, the second thing is that, that credit cards and debt, that that's actually to me a very low priority to move over. That, you know, just because you have your mortgage or your credit card with, let's say, RBC, you know, you don't need to keep your checking or savings account there. You can keep your mortgage there. You can keep your debt there, but just pay it from your credit union account. Um, and that also with credit cards, like really there is no ethical credit card. All the credit, all the credit unions do their credit cards with a third party partnership. So it's not really the credit union that's doing it. It's, there's just not a great sort of ethical credit card solution. So my suggestion is actually to keep the credit card that you've got, especially if you've got a long track record on it, you kind of want to keep that credit card because that contributes to your credit score. So you might want to like keep that. But actually what I suggest people do is to shop around for a credit card that really from a financial lens um, makes sense for you that obviously like point systems, things like that. Um, for example, with my family, like we've got American Express that we use for a lot of big purchases and I've got a Tangerine card that has really good cash back. Um, so, you know, those are sort of the primary credit cards that I use uh, that sadly, like, like don't let debt be a barrier for you to switch that really I want you focused on your checking and your savings accounts. And really it is wherever you have the most deposits. So that's why I say start with your emergency fund because that's probably gonna be where most of your deposits are. And if you can get a better rate and if you can get it you know, into a credit union where it's gonna have that local impact, that's really the impact we have with our savings is through our deposits and making sure that our deposits are with a more ethical institution. I hope that's good information about uh, 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 savings and credit cards. Happy to come back to it in the Q&A. If I said something, you want to go back to it, that's great. But want to spend you know, the bulk of our time talking about sustainable investing. This is where I'm just like the biggest nerd. And I've been doing this for a very long time. I've helped thousands of people uh, create sustainable investment portfolios. So going to spend most of my time here. Um, really, you know, the first thing I want to communicate is that most people just don't think about their investments at all. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've met people and oh, I'll talk about sustainable investing and they'll be like, I have no idea where my investments are. Um, the line that I use is that people spend more time choosing avocados in the grocery store than they spend choosing uh, investments for their, you know, retirement accounts. And hey, don't get me wrong. Like, uh, you got to choose good avocados, you know, you got to like feel them out and do it. But what I'm saying is that, you know, please spend some time, some thought thinking about researching your investments that for too many people, it's just like literally spent zero minutes. You know, they walk into a bank, the person says here, buy this mutual fund. They're actually selling you that mutual fund. You don't really understand what's in there. You just buy it. And, you know, so really this is my, you know, my hope is that people do put more consideration and more thoughtfulness into choosing their investments. 
Um, before we talk about sustainable investments, I think it's important to understand, you know, a traditional portfolio, how most people do it. So this is kind of some of the basic language that'll, you know, help us understand, you know, how to build a sustainable portfolio. So when it comes to a traditional portfolio, this is often what we call like a balanced portfolio. It's going to be a pie chart and it's going to be a mix of both stocks and bonds. Okay. Um, stocks with stocks, we're owning shares in the company. Right. And so we're hoping that the share price goes up. Now, stocks are kind of like the rabbit in the race because they're very erratic, right? Like the stock market goes up and then down and then up and then down and, you know, can be very erratic. Now, over time, stocks have been one of the best ways to make money. But in order to get those long term returns, we have to accept short term volatility. Right. So that's the risk that we're taking with stocks is that short-term volatility in order to get those higher, longer-term uh, returns. Bonds are more like the turtle in the race. So bonds, bonds are debt. We are loaning money to governments and corporations. And because we're loaning the money, we get paid an interest rate every single year on that debt. And so again, with bonds, bonds are, aren't sexy, right? Bonds are boring, bonds are safe. The bonds are very much the turtle in the race. Now, what's great about stocks and bonds is that they tend to move in opposite directions. They're what we call inversely correlated. So when the stock market does really well, we actually expect the price of bonds to fall by a little bit. It's not a big deal because your stocks are doing well, right? But the opposite is true is that when stocks crash, we actually expect bonds to do go up a little bit. Now, it's not always the case, and especially last year, like 2022 was a very exceptional year where stocks were down and bonds were down too. And it was like a once in sort of every 50 years event that the stock market came down, but because interest rates went up, we had inflation, bond prices came down. So, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but for the most part, stocks and bonds tend to move in opposite directions, which is why, you know, they really work well together in a portfolio that this is the first layer of diversification that we want, is that we always want to have a mix of stocks and bonds. And this mix is largely going to be determined by your age and your risk tolerance, how much risk you're comfortable with. Um, the general rule, and obviously everyone's different, so I go through this process with clients, but the, the, the starting point for the conversation is that your bonds should be roughly your age. So if someone's 20 years old, right, they have a long time. If the market crashes, no big deal. They don't need the money for retirement. You know, they've got a long time. They can take more risk. They should only have 20% bonds, 80% stocks. But someone who's 80 years old does not have time that if the stock market crashes, they could be in deep trouble. And so someone who's 80 years old should have closer to 80% bonds and only 20% stocks. Now, obviously, it's going to depend for everyone. This is part of the work I do as a financial planner is like helping you figure out the right mix of stocks and bonds. But, you know, this is a tr very traditional balanced portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. For someone who's roughly 40 years old, you know, this would often kind of be a starting point in terms of their investment portfolio. Um, because I like using sort of case studies, and I know there is action against RBC, uh, I decided to kind of choose this RBC Select Balanced Portfolio as kind of my case study. Uh, this is a very traditional portfolio. If you walk into an RBC branch and you say, I want to invest some money, they'll be like, yeah, here, take this RBC Select Balanced Portfolio. You can see here that, you know, fixed income, this is another word for bonds. Equities is another word for stocks that between fixed income and cash, we've got about 40%, you know, safer things. And then the stocks are split up between Canadian stocks, US stocks, European stocks, Asia Pacific stocks, and emerging markets as well. And so you can see again, you know, that this is sort of a nice diversified portfolio, a mix of stocks and bonds. And then our stocks are going to be globally diversified, right? Which is, again, you know, that's what we want. This is a very traditional portfolio. Unfortunately, there are some things in here that you're probably not going to be very happy about. That, you know, it's a little bit awkward because it's actually a fund of funds. So, you know, when we open it up, they just list all the funds, but I have to go inside each of those funds, peel back the layers of the onion to see what's actually inside. And when I look at the US stocks, you know, the top 10 holdings, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, which is Google, but here we have ExxonMobil, you know, front and center. 
very, very high allocation to ExxonMobil. Um, when we look at the Canadian side of things, RBC is the biggest company. So again, this is an RBC mutual fund, asset manager, with RBC stocks inside of that mutual fund. So RBC is like investing in people's money inside their own stock. From there, you know, Canadian Natural Resources, Enbridge, Suncor, you know, it's even got this fund in here. There's like another layer of the onions that it's the RBC Canadian Small and Mid-Cap Resources Fund. So this is going to be mining and oil and gas, right? And so these are going to be a whole bunch of small companies that have been put inside this fund and this fund. So you're going to have very high exposure to fossil fuels in a very traditional portfolio. It's just the way it is. This is like the default setting. Right. Um, and this is why it's so important to be able to consider what a sustainable portfolio looks like. And now this is the framework that I use different ways of doing it, but I really like this framework. It's worked for a lot of people. So, you know, the language that I use is that most of your portfolio, the biggest slices here are going to be what I call doing less evil stocks and bonds. Right. This is where the goal is to get very similar returns to a traditional portfolio, but we wanna get rid of the nasty stuff. From there, we can carve out part of the portfolio for green stocks. This is going out of our way to invest in renewable energy and clean technology and water infrastructure, but we don't wanna put all of our money, we just wanna carve out part of our money for green stocks. And I've got part of the portfolio carved out for impact bonds. So these are like impact investments, things like community bonds and like really like grassroots local stuff. This is a great way to have the biggest impact with your money. But again, you know, we don't want to do it with all of our money. We only want to carve out part of our portfolio for these impact bonds. And what I'm going to do is kind of go through these one at a time. I'm, I sort of lump in the doing less evil stocks and bonds together. Right. And then, but I'll go through the different uh, sections so that we can dive a little bit deeper into the approaches and language that we use to do less evil and to sort of have the green and the impact stuff. So when it comes to the doing less evil side of the equation, there are three main strategies that we use. And it's really important that you understand the difference between these strategies. And in a perfect world, we're going to use all three of them. So they are complementary. The first one is what we call negative screens, okay? This is often what we refer to as divestment, where we completely exclude companies from certain sectors. Now, we often use the language of quote-unquote sin stocks. So ethical investing had its start in religious communities. So the Mennonites here in Canada were absolute leaders in ethical investing. So they wanted to exclude things like weapons and tobacco and gambling and alcohol, things that were obviously counter to their values. And that now for a lot of us, specifically on the climate side of things, we want to add to that fossil fuels, energy extraction, pipelines, you know, utilities that burn fossil fuels, you know, that, that really we're probably going to have more than just the quote unquote sin stocks, right, that we want to exclude. So that's the first tactic is a negative screen saying not one penny into those companies. The second approach that we can use, it's what's known as ESG analysis, environmental, social, and governance analysis, right? Now, this is what I did my thesis on like 15 years ago. We're starting to look at these ESG factors. Um, nobody knew what I was talking about for the longest time. And now ESG is kind of blown up in the sense that you know, a lot of people refer to sustainable investing as ESG investing. I wanna be clear, this is one tactic, just one tactic that we can use. What we're doing here is we're looking at company by company. We're looking at their environmental, social, and governance performance. So companies have to uh, 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 record and publish this different ESG data. So environmental issues are gonna be things like CO2 emissions, water use, you know, waste, disposal, things like that. Social issues are a lot of employee satisfaction, um, things like uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics, right? And supply chain that will, who are you buying things and how well are they treating their employees? Governance is going to be about how the company is governed. Things like the board of directors versus the CEO. Are they the same person? That's a problem. It's going to be looking at things like executive compensation, and diversity on the board of directors. So kind of how the decisions get made. When it comes to ESG, you know, really what we're doing is, is taking all these different criteria for all these different companies, giving them these scores 
and then using it to compare companies within the same sector. So ESG data, it doesn't really help when companies are in a different sector, like the ESG score for Tesla doesn't really, I can't really compare it to the ESG score for Exxon. They're very different companies, very different sectors, right? Also ESG, it doesn't look at what they sell. So, you know, Tesla doesn't get credit in ESG scores for the fact that they sell electric vehicles, right? They don't. Instead, we're looking at the performance, right? And the, the disclosure um, of these ESG, you know, how well they treat their employees, how much energy and waste they're using. Exxon, on the other hand, they don't get dinged on ESG for the fact that they sell oil. That's not really what it's looking at. Now, there's a little bit of debate around what we call scope three emissions and should that be included? And, you know, so there's, you know, things are shifting in this world, but I really want to be clear that when it comes to these high level ESG scores, very, very useful for comparing companies within the same sector. So I can compare Tesla to Ford and to GM and to BMW, but not very useful when it comes to um, uh, uh, comparing companies across different sectors, that that becomes a lot more problematic. And again, you know, with ESG funds, if they primarily, if they only use this strategy, you're still going to get fossil fuels in there. That if you want to, you know, divest from fossil fuels, you need to make sure there's a negative screen or an exclusion. And then in addition to that, hopefully they're doing ESG so that the remaining sectors, you know, we are getting those sort of quote unquote sustainability leaders from those sectors. The last strategy we use in the doing less evil side of the portfolio is shareholder activism. So this is actually completely contrary to negative screening because if we don't own any shares, then we don't get to do shareholder activism. Instead, shareholder activism is when we own shares in a company, we get to push that company in a certain direction, right? That every year they have an AGM, annual general meeting, and there are shareholder resolutions. And that as shareholders, we get to vote on those resolutions. So, you know, with RVC, I think it's coming up next week that they've got their big AGM. And I know that there are shareholder resolutions relating to climate change and uh, 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 indigenous rights. And that shareholders get to vote their shares on those resolutions. And obviously as sustainable investors, we wanna make sure that if we do own shares in companies that we don't love, but we're kind of holding our nose and owning shares in those companies that we wanna make sure that our we are voting, that our votes are pushing that company in the right direction. Now, nobody's expected to actually show up at the meeting. Uh, you don't have to go there and like vote your shares. No, no, no. The way it works is that we own these funds and the funds vote our shares, vote for us, you know, on behalf of our shares. So it's what's called proxy voting. So that basically we give the fund manager control of our votes. And so again, we want to make sure that the funds that we're investing in have explicit language that says, hey, we are going to, you know, vote for these measures and push this company in the right direction. So these are kind of the three different tactics on the doing less evil side of the equation. You know, again, we probably want to be doing all of them, but everyone's going to have a different line in the sand in terms of the negative screens. You know, the, the, the ESG, you know, understanding how that applies and making sure that we are choosing the companies with the best scores. And, you know, then the companies that still sneak through that maybe we're not in love with, but, you know, we can kind of hold our nose and still vote um, uh, or sorry, own those shares. We do want to make sure that our shares are pushing that company in the right direction. So what I've got here is I've got like a, a case study here of because I did the RBC sort of balanced portfolio. So this is what's known as the iShares ESG balanced ETF portfolio. So this is what I would consider a doing less evil mix of both stocks and bonds. Again, it's like layers of the onions. You know, this is going to have U.S. stocks in here, Canadian stocks in here, right? Um, uh, that these are going to be bonds in here and government bonds down here. This is EAFE, Europe, Australia, Far East. So again, this is a mix of stocks and bonds. And it's as geographically diverse as that RBC balanced portfolio that we looked at. But they have a methodology that incorporates some of these different tactics. The first thing they do is the ESG rating. So they only include companies that have a score of triple B or above. 
uh, the way it works with these ESG ratings, at least for this company, MSCI, is that AAA is like the highest score. AAA is like the most sustainable. Then it goes AA, single A, and then triple B, double B, single B, and then triple C is like the nastiest. Like those are the least sustainable companies. So companies have to be triple B or above to get included in this fund. So it's roughly the top half of companies based on their ESG rate. From there, it's going to exclude companies with severe controversies. So any human rights abuses or child labor or any of those like terrible atrocities, you know, they get cut. From there, they do exclude fossil fuels. They exclude all businesses with an industry tied to fossil fuels, thermal coal, uh, oil, gas, and the entire energy sector. An exception is provided for companies with over 50% revenue from renewable energy and alternative fuels. So, you know, there might be a, a, a utility that's mostly renewable energy, but a little bit of natural gas. And, you know, that might sneak in here. But, you know, for the most part, it's going to get rid of, you know, oil companies, pipelines, things like that. As well, other screens. So it excludes companies with material business involvement in adult entertainment, alcohol, civilian firearms, controversial weapons, conventional weapons, for-profit prisons, gambling, genetically modified organisms, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, palm oil, predatory lending, and tobacco. Whoo. Now, there might be some things in there that you're like, hey, I don't mind nuclear power or I don't mind GMOs, you know, but, you know, this is a broad screen. This is one of the more exhaustive screens that they really tried to get not rid of just the quote unquote sin sectors, but also things that environmentalists would be upset about. And, you know, it does exclude cannabis. You can see down here for better, for worse. So if you want your weed stocks, you know, you're going to have to buy them separately from this um, because it does exclude cannabis. So, you know, looking at the companies that are inside of this, notice that, you know, there are still a lot of banks in here. So this is a problem with divestment is that we can exclude fossil fuels, but what about the banks that fund fossil fuels? And if you want to exclude RBC from your portfolio entirely, that's fine. We can do that, but it's not going to be this approach. You're going to have to go for an approach that's a little bit further down the sustainability spectrum. I'm going to show you some of my model portfolios later. I have what I call my crunchy granola pie, you know, which doesn't have RBC in here at all. But again, looking at those screens, you might think, oh, you know, divested from fossil fuels, it's not going to have the big banks. Well, actually, it does. So this is why it's really important to look at the top holdings. But obviously, we're not going to have Exxon. You know, we're not going to have Philip Morris tobacco. We're not going to have Lockheed Martin weapons. You know, notice that even Apple isn't in here. And that's because there was a big controversy with Apple in their supply chain with a Chinese company called Foxconn that was really not treating their employees well. So there were enough red flags around Apple such that it's not in here. Amazon, not in here for their worker rights. So, you know, it's interesting. It's not perfect, but this gives you an idea of a doing less evil fund. There are over 1500 companies in here. So this is only the top 10. So it's still very diversified, but, you know, just to give you a little flavor for what's inside. People always ask me about performance. So I actually did the RBF 460, which is the balanced mutual fund, which is the orange line, compared to GBAL, which is that iShares uh, uh, ESG ETF portfolio, which is the blue line. You can see that actually the sustainable option has outperformed since it started in 2020. But really what I want to point out here is how closely they move together that the returns are always going to be very similar. And then it kind of depends on the fossil fuel side of things, you know, whether, um, you know, the approach is going to outperform or underperform. It's always going to be a by small margin. Really, my goal here is to earn you about the same returns as you would otherwise. And in this case, since, you know, I think it was sort of like um, uh, 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 September of 2020 that this fund launched, right? You can see sort of COVID crash, and then it came back up, and then it did bad, really well for a year. And then, you know, the stock market kind of, you know, did very poorly during 2022, that really they're tracking about the same. So really what I want to communicate here is that sustainable portfolios about the same returns as a traditional portfolio, but just do it in a way that's aligned with your values. Um, I do want to touch on greenwashing. I'm just going to look at the clock here so that I can make sure that I cover everything. Um, I am going to try to move a little bit quicker so that we can have some Q&A at the end. Um, but when it comes to greenwashing, uh, you know, this is a huge issue. ESG is a really popular label right now, um, which is great because it means there are a lot of different options. I showed you like one, doing less evil. I literally have dozens of options in my databases 
Um, so, you know, there are lots of different options available for you, but, you know, don't trust the label. Don't just because it says fossil fuel free or just because it says ESG or sustainable, don't trust that you're really got to look inside. Uh, I can help you, you know, learn how to look inside or, you know, I've done some analysis on some of these funds myself, but really, you know, this is my way of saying don't trust the label. Uh, when it comes to the green stocks, you know, this is the green stuff. Again, a whole bunch of different options. This is uh, a list I have on the free resources section of my website. So if you just go to goodinvesting.com, uh, free resources, that these are sort of my green stocks or what I call my doing more good stocks, you know, clean energy, clean energy, you know, clean energy, clean energy. A lot of these, you know, are renewable energy, but we also have water in here. We have sustainable growth, which is more like clean tech. And we have this World ESG Impact ETF, which is based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the SDGs, which is really cool. Um, so, you know, these are all different options that are available. Uh, I do want to give you a bit of a sort of, you know, caveat when it comes specifically to the green stuff. Uh, this is a renewable energy ETF, ICLN, compared to the RBC fund. And you can see it's outperformed. Like if we bought it back in 2018, hey, you've done really well with green stocks, but I want to show how wildly volatile this renewable energy stocks have been. And this is really why I only want you to put part of your money into these like doing more good or these green stocks. I meet too many people that are like, I want to put all of my investments into renewable energy or clean tech. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Because what if you had bought them up here? You know, these, they, it was a bit of a bubble. This is when Biden got elected. We had co the COVID recovery. And then remember Biden won, beat Trump and just green energy stocks popped. But it was clear they were overvalued. They were in a bit of a bubble because then they dropped. And then since then, you know, they've been very, very flat. So this is my way of just saying that when it comes to these green stocks, you know, don't get sort of caught in this sort of sexy trap thinking you should put more than, you know, more of your money than you really should. We kind of want to limit it to a very small percentage, maybe 10 or 15 percent of your portfolio, you know, no, no more than that into these green stocks. Um, the fact is they're less diversified. They don't have the global diversification, diversification by sector. Like they're just not going to be as diversified because it's only green companies. And the result is that they are much more volatile. So I'm not saying it's a bad investment that in the long run, hey, renewable energy could do well. I don't know. I don't have the crystal ball. Tough to say. But what I will say is that I do expect them to be more volatile, which, you know, I think we have to be a little bit worried about. From there, the last section of the pie I'm going to talk about are impact investments. So this is like my favorite part of the pie chart, because this is where we are loaning money directly to nonprofits and co-ops in your community, hopefully if there are some available, this is where we can have a direct positive impact. So whenever we're talking about stocks and bonds and investments, you know, that's always indirect. We're always sort of buying and selling them from other investors. Whereas with impact investments, we are loaning money directly to the organizations that are just doing incredible work. Um, I have, again, a list of this, uh, goodinvesting.com and my sort of free resources, my impact investments. So a bunch of options that are available right now in the Q&A. If we want to like look at some of these, I could dig in, you know, Fair Finance Fund, really, really cool. This is a sustainable food bond, right? So it's basically loans to uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, in, in the sustainable food sector uh, here in Ontario. Really, really cool option. Um, uh, uh, solar share, some people in Ontario might know those. Those are uh, uh, community owned solar projects, greening sacred spaces. So this is a project in Ottawa to do energy efficiency upgrades to faith based spaces. So temples and mosques and churches and synagogues, you know, getting energy efficiency upgrades, solar panels and, you know, more efficient HVAC systems, stuff like that. And uh, Habitat for Humanity, you know, really cool in terms of affordable housing. You know, how does a nonprofit buy land? They have to buy the land to build homes. Uh, they've done it through community bonds. So I could go on about this for hours. I love impact investments. Um, again, you don't want to put all of your money into these things. We really only want to carve out a small part of it, you know, especially with the impact bonds. You know, they're not liquid. You are locked in for a certain period of time, right? So we don't want to put all of our money into these things. Um, really what we want to do is have a nice balanced portfolio, a nice mix between doing less evil and doing more good with most of our money invested in these doing less evil approaches. 
Um, so, you know, just a couple examples of sort of pies that I've put together. Again, you know, these are specific things that we can track. These are illustrative purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. You know, really, you know, we should probably have a chat about it before you take any drastic action here. But just for illustrative examples, this is my organic couch potato pie. So there is a very popular approach in Canada called couch potato investing. It's exactly what it sounds like. You know, you buy and hold. It's a very lazy way to invest, which I love. This is not complicated. It's simple. We're not trying to, you know, buy and sell. This is long term. So, you know, the couch potato pie is very famous. So I created my organic couch potato pie as sort of my sustainable version of this uh, as well. You know, I did tease this before that if you really don't want any Canadian banks, if you want to, you know, don't want to own one share of RBC, then I would sort of nudge you towards what I call my crunchy granola pie. You know, happy to talk about this and what it looks like and, you know, some of the, the benefits and drawbacks of that, but really, you know, designed to, again, get you the same types of investment returns, but obviously in a way that's much more aligned with your values. Um, to wrap up here, you know, I'll just talk about my change theory, which is really, you know, the goal of my company is to help a million Canadians invest intentionally. Um, I've reached now over 10,000 Canadians, uh, whether it's working with them one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's been through my blog or, you know, YouTube or my podcast, you know, there are a lot of different ways that I put content out into the world. Um, and that really my goal is to help as many Canadians as possible think about their investments and invest intentionally. Because I really think that if we can help people do it in a way that is uh, easy, that is, uh, uh, you know, gets the same level of returns that they would otherwise, that, you know, really we're gonna hit a tipping point and this is just gonna become the default way to invest. That if you can just invest in a way that is more sustainable without having to sacrifice financial returns, that I think more and more people are gonna want to do that. Um, the way I do it, you know, I've got one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's sort of my bread and butter, you know, work with clients, do financial planning with them, uh, sort out all their questions and help them uh, build a, a sustainable portfolio. Uh, I offer do, uh, I also do offer an online course. So for people who are just getting started, you know, if you've only got a little bit, you want to kind of dip your toe in the water, you know, I do have an online course. Um, and, you know, want to be clear that everyone gets a free consultation. So if you go to my website, goodinvesting.com, there's a little like free consultation button. Um, we'll ask you a couple of questions and you can like book a free consultation, really figure out which of these kind of paths make sense for you. If you've got other questions, just like know that I'm here. I'm such a nerd. This is what I do. This is what I love doing is helping people figure this stuff out. So, you know, really my encouragement is, is to go on my website, book a free consultation. If you do want to learn more, if you do feel stuck in this process at all, know that, you know, I've helped lots and lots of people do this. Um, my final thoughts before we kind of open it up to the Q&A is that really this is easier than it's ever been. It used to be, I talked to people that looked at this, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was just getting started, even before that. And, you know, there weren't a lot of options. It was quite challenging, but it's way easier now than it was before. Uh, you don't need to sacrifice your financial goals. So it's not like you're going to retire with less money or, you know, for your kid's education, you know, they're still going to have, you know, uh, 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 that, that ability to go to whatever university they want. Um, really, that, that there's no need to sacrifice financial returns when it comes to this. And so really, you know, my encouragement to you is to put your money where your values are, uh, to give it some thought, to ask some tough questions, to think about it, talk about it. And then I love from the video at the introduction that as you're going through this process, you know, talk to other people about it. Um, once you've actually done it, you know, let people know that you've done it, that really to me, this is sort of working towards that tipping point where you know this just becomes the default option that of course people are going to be with a credit union and of course people are going to have a, a portfolio that's aligned with their values like duh of course i'm going to do that you know that's really my vision and my hope uh what i'm trying to help people do that's it for me um i'm happy to kind of want to stop sharing and i can see the question has been you know, really, uh, uh, the, the chat has been very active. I haven't been able to read as much as I'd like. I've been kind of focused on the presentation, but I assume there's been lots of discussion and I'm hopeful that there are a few questions for me. There are lots of questions for you, yeah. Yay. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna, give me one moment here. I'm just gonna pull down, we've got some sunshine here. So I'm just gonna pull down a blind. Can I everyone see I'm... both there of us? Go. I think so, Perfect. right? Yeah. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, I don't even know where to start. I guess, yeah, we have a bunch ah. of questions that come through. Um, we had some at the beginning that maybe I'll just quickly sure. touch on first. One of the first questions we had was, I'm very curious to understand alternatives to TD's E-Series, the couch potato investing yeah. approach. Could there be a responsible equivalent of TD's E-Series? Um, so the E-Series is a bit of a, a unique sort of beast. Um, and to be honest, even the couch potato, like Dan Bartolotti himself, who's like the Canadian couch potato, he doesn't really talk about the E-Series anymore. Um, instead, you know, the replacement for that is that we use these things called ETFs, exchange traded funds. So it can be helpful to understand the difference between mutual funds versus ETFs, exchange traded funds, which is that they're both basically the same thing. They're both funds, but mutual funds are sold through like a salesperson for the most part. Um, and ETFs are bought and sold directly online. Um, what's unique about the E-Series is that they're mutual funds, but that you could buy online. So, you know, that's why they were so popular when they first got started and really for that. Now we just have ETFs that you can just buy. And so, you know, a good example would be there are these all-in-one ETFs. Uh, that's actually a section I've got in my free resources. So, you know, BMO's got one, um, iShares has theirs that I kind of used as a case study. Uh, that would be the easiest way of doing it. Um, and then there are, but there are other options. Like what I help people do is very much set up a couch potato style portfolio, but you know, you can customize use using um, your, um, you know, your specific uh, values, your definitions. So, you know, really, I would just say that, that like, is there an ethical version of the E-Series? Not exactly, but I'll be honest that the E-Series is a little bit outdated now. I think it's been surpassed by these like all-in-one ETFs and there are sustainable versions of those. Awesome. I think that's great. Um, someone also asked about mortgage companies like Nesto. Uh, we were or we were considering Nesto, but we stuck with Tangerine out of sheer inertia. Any thoughts sure. on those mortgage sure. companies? Sure. So again, when it comes to debt, there really isn't like an ethical version. Understand that it's not like your deposits where there's that knock on that multiplied effect from fractional reserve banking, that when it comes to debt, you're just borrowing the money. So really when it comes to debt, just get the best rate. Like don't worry about the ethics of it so much. Just like look at it from a purely financial lens. Who's going to give you the best terms? Shop around. Inertia is a huge problem for people where they just go with the default setting or they only go to their one bank or credit union. And you never want to do that. You really want to be shopping around for the different interest rates, the best terms, you know, but really when it comes to debt, there really isn't much bearing on the, the ethical aspect. The only thing is obviously you are paying interest. So who is that interest going to? So tan Tangerine is owned by Scotia. So your interest is helping Scotia's, you know, profitability. So, you know, but from a systemic perspective, you know, really this is a, a place where I would just say shop around you know, regardless of the sort of, you know, ethical side. And just know that if like two are equal, then obviously go with the credit union. Like I'll be happier with that. But from my perspective, you know, really just get the best deal you can on your debt. Yeah, helpful to have that, you know, distinction between where you're investing, where your debt is, those those pieces right there are different ways and different approaches for different parts of our portfolio. Right. Um, okay, Pam had a question about... I opened some accounts with Meridian um, nice. to manage our regular day-to-day -day bank banking. And then a great first step, oh, sorry, great first step. Our investments are all with TD Waterhouse. Question, would sustainable stock through TD Waterhouse be any different than through Qtrade, for example? Right. So, ooh. so yes, these are very, very different things. So I want to be clear that the distinction between the institution that holds your investments versus the investments themselves, okay? So there are kind of two layers to this. There's the vaults, where you keep your vaults, and then there's like, what's inside the vault? So TD Waterhouse, okay? That is really gonna depend on what's inside the vault. That just because that's where the money is doesn't tell me what's inside. Now, to be clear, your advisor at TD Wealth Management, you're gonna be paying an advisor a percentage of your money every single year to do this for you they definitely have access to sustainable investments. That TD has a whole lineup of sustainable ETFs and that with wealth management, especially if it's, you know, you've got a bigger, uh, uh, large, you know, larger amount of money in there, they can buy whatever the heck they want. 
And so if you direct them and you work with them to say, hey, I want a sustainable portfolio, they should totally be able to do that. However, a lot of them won't. That I'm curious in the chat, has anyone like asked their advisor about responsible investments or fossil fuel divestment? What was the reaction from your advisor? And in my experience, overwhelmingly at the banks, it gets shut down, that they don't want to do it. They talk you out of it. They'll, you know, even in some cases, like scaremonger, so you're going to lose all your money. Or like I had one client who came to me because her advisor like made her cry, made her feel so stupid for how dare she ask about these things. Like, it's just terrible. So, you know, at TD Wealth Management, they could, although it's really going to depend on your advisor and whether they have any expertise at all. Um, at Meridian, so you mentioned Q-Trade. Q-Trade is what's known as an online brokerage, right? So when it comes to these online brokerages, this is what I do. This is what I help my clients with, is I help them sign up with Q-Trade, or another one is Quest Trade, right? There are a bunch of, there's well, Simple, all the banks have. So TD has, you know, what is it like Easy Web or like um, Easy Trade, something like that. Um, uh, 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 RBC has direct investing. These are all what are called online brokerages that let you do it yourself. And this is what I help clients do. And so definitely what that allows us to do is to number one, have way more control over our investments because you get to intentionally choose your avocados. It's also way cheaper because you're not paying the advisor that you can pay me an hourly fee upfront as a financial planner to help you like figure this stuff out and to do the education and to figure it out. And then, you know, and then once it's done, the fees are like literally a fraction of the cost once you learn how to do it yourself. And now I know DIY sounds scary, but I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you it's not it really a little bit of learning goes a long way in this. Once we get it, we can automate things. It really is about, you know, a little bit of basic knowledge, which is really my bread and butter, what I help clients do and figure out. So, you know, certainly my situation, my suggestion is that if you've shifted everything to Meridian, great, awesome. You're checking the savings, amazing. The next step is to look at your investments. Might be worth a conversation with your advisor to see if, can, do they have options? These options definitely exist. Do they know about them? Can they talk to you about which ones are greenwashing and which ones aren't? Do they have that expertise? And if not, please shop around, set up a free consultation with me. I'm definitely, you know, I've helped a lot of people do this, but I'm so I'm not the only one. There are other groups that can definitely help you do this. Um, but my suggestion would be understand that, again, you use Meridian for your checking and savings. Your investment is a different thing. You can hold those anywhere. So, you know, Qtrade is a great online platform. You know, there are other ones where you can do it. You know, really, it is about, you know, coming up with a plan and then shifting things into that plan. Is that helpful? I think so, yes. Um, quickly, uh, for ESG stuff, someone said, who does the scoring of ESG? And then also, what's the difference between ESG and social responsible investing? Should be aware Ooh. when we're looking for guidance from SRI versus ESG practitioners? Oh, this is a big question. Um, I will just address Natalie's question first, just because it relates to what I just had there, which is in, when you invest in pre-made funds, you pay a, an advisor fee. Yes. So I didn't get into this into my presentation because I didn't, I wanted to stick it to the values alignment, but yes, there's a whole thing. The acronym you need to know when it comes to investing is M-E-R, Management Expense Ratio. This is code word for annual fee. And to be clear for mutual funds, especially those like RBC balanced mutual funds, fossil fuel free mutual funds, you're looking at about 2.25% annually. Part of that goes to the salesperson that sold you, the advisor that sold you the product. Part of that goes to the manager who's like choosing what to buy, what to sell. But it's about two and a quarter ETFs, exchange traded funds. By learning to do it yourself, we get your fees down to about 0.25%. Per year from two and a quarter down to a quarter like it's literally a fraction of the cost so this is why diy investing is amazing this is why we can do meet our financial goals and still align it with our values that especially if you're in mutual funds my goodness come talk to me i will save you so much money in fees learning how to do it yourself it's going to be amazing but really important to understand those mers those management expense ratios um okay oh do you have a question i can yeah, I was just going to say, someone said, um, can that online investing be done within RSPs or TFSAs? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this is how we do it is uh, all tax shelters are available. 
RSP, TFSA, RESP, Registered Education Savings Plans, RDSP, Registered Disability Savings Plans. There's about to be a new one, which is the FHSA, First Time Home Buyer Savings Account. So, you know, these are all tax shelters. Yes, we can do those through QTrade, through QuestTrade, all of the above. Everything is available to us. Same thing, same insurance schemes, kind of like I talked about before, the, you know, instead of the deposit insurance, it's the Canadian Protector Investment Fund. So, you know, have doing it online, it's the same protection as having it with a bank. So it really is the same thing. It just gives you a lot more control, which means more intentional decisions and way lower fees. Um, I'll address the, the ESG question. So there are two big companies. Um, that do ESG scores, MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital Indexes, and um, Morningstar. And Morningstar bought a company called Sustainalytics, right? So it's Sustainalytics does the ESG, but they're now owned by Morningstar. Those are the two big ESG data providers. There are way more of those uh, 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 data providers, but those are by far the two biggest ones. And then to be clear with these acronyms, oh my goodness, the acronym. So SRI, Socially Responsible Investing. This is like when I started, that's what people called it. This is the broad strategy. This is what I call, you know, sustainable investing. Some people call it socially responsible investing. Some people call it responsible investing. I call it sustainable investing. And then ESG is one of those tactics under that umbrella. And so I talked about the negative screening or divestment, ESG, and shareholder engagement are all tactics followed by socially responsible investors. So really that SRI, socially responsible investing, is the umbrella term. And then ESG, these ESG scores, is one tactic that is used under that umbrella. That helps. That's good to know. Okay. Okay. Where do we go next? <laughs> I, I love think, it. Keep them coming. Yeah, Bart, I'm not sure whether your um, question was fully answered. RETFSA and RESPs, any specific suggestions where we only can choose from a limited number of options? Um, maybe you've already addressed that. Yeah. I mean, so you, there's no reason for you to have a limited number of options. Like if you have an advisor that's like, oh, you have a limited number of options. There's, that's a bad advisor. That's not an advisor. That's a salesperson. They're selling you those options. There are a lot of options. So to be clear, you've got your institution, you've got your, you know, your bank or your institution investment platform that can be RBC, TD, can also be QTrade, QuestTrade, whatever the platform is, the, the, the place where you hold your investments. From there, you have your vaults and you have your RSP and your TFSA and your RESP. And these are all different accounts that you hold at that institution. And then inside each of those vaults, you can hold whatever you want. You can hold mutual funds, you can hold ETFs, you can just keep cash in there, you know? And then whatever is inside of those vaults, you know, those are tax shelters. So it gets to grow tax-free, which is amazing. So really it's like, this is the kind of the, the choice when I do, when I help a client and I go through this process with them, right? I usually start by coming up with their pie chart, which is their investment mix of doing less evil, doing more good and the funds, the actual investments that you wanna own and get the ones that are low cost and diversified and aligned with your values. From there, we do a bit of the, what we call tax optimization, which is figuring out which vaults to hold those inside of because everyone's going to be different about whether they should do a TFSA versus an RSP versus this new first home buyer savings account versus, you know, RESP versus, you know, that everyone is very unique in terms of their tax situation. So we come up with your pie chart, then we figure out which vaults it's going to go in. And then what we do is open those vaults at the proper institution that lets us buy the stuff that we want. That's the sort of full control custom part of it. And again, I really, if there's so many options, there are like now hundreds of mutual funds and ETFs that are sustainable. If you're talking to someone, they're like, no, you can only do the RBC ones. Well, guess what? They work for RBC. They're getting commissions to sell you the RBC products. That's how it works. That's what gets them their bonus, right? So really that's, that person is not looking out for your best interests. Definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And somewhat like on that note, sort of, um, had, we had a question. Would you say there are any truly fossil free funds, fossil fuel free funds that perform similarly to traditional portfolios at this time? 
Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be uh, uh, some divergence, right? So the way to think about it, the way I think about it is on the doing less evil side, that it's going to be a spectrum from a small step in the right direction, right? Which is probably going to use more of the ESG and the shareholder engagement, less of the divestment stuff, because those small step in the right direction, they are going to earn almost exactly the same returns. And if we had more time, you know, I'd be happy to like chart them and I could show you and like how closely they attract to each other, right? Now, if we're going to do fossil fuel free, now we are excluding an entire sector, which is the energy sector, which is, you know, about, I would say five to 6% of the global stock market. In Canada, it's a little, it's higher than that, right? Because our economy is so fossil fuel centered. So obviously now that's going to mean there's going to be a divergence there, a deviation from the benchmark performance. And in years where oil prices go up and fossil fuel stocks do well, like last year, right? We had the war, we had the, you know, price went up, like all this stuff happened where oil stocks did very well last year. Obviously the fossil fuel free are going to have underperformed, right? Whereas in the years prior to that, like 2020, remember when the price of oil collapsed, like it went negative that one day, it was really weird because it was just COVID and oil prices collapsed. And, you know, there've been a lot of busts in the past that in years where fossil fuel stocks underperform, then the fossil fuel is going to be a little bit more than the average. And so the more we go through that spectrum and, you know, go from the small step in the right direction, all the way to the like crunchy granola option, the divergence is going to get wider that some years you'll outperform, some years you'll underperform. But when I do the math over a long period of time, you know, it is pretty clear that, especially over a long period, five years, 10 years, um, that the fossil fuel free have done just as well, if not a little bit better. But obviously every day, every week, every month, every year, it's gonna be a little bit different. And what determines that is how much we're deviating, how far we're going on that spectrum. Great, that makes sense, yeah. Um, a few questions that are kind of related, I think. Someone has asked about, you know, is it a good idea to do a risk tolerance form with the places we bank at first before investing? Someone was also curious about um, CIBC and some key questions or areas we should have before meeting with a big bank to do investing. Yeah. So maybe, and and yes. someone also asked, um, I'm terrified of direct <laughs> investing. Invest, Any yeah. advice? So I guess yes. maybe a little bit about preparation for these conversations. Okay. Lightning <laughs> round, lightning days. round here. Lightning yeah. round, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so before you go into a meeting, you know, with a bank, the, the questions that you want to be asking is, number one, are there sustainable options? What are they? In terms of evaluating, you want to look at two things. Number one is the methodology. So understanding what approaches they're using. Are they using exclusions versus ESG versus shareholder engagement? Hopefully all three. And number two is you want to see a full list of the companies inside, not just the top 10. You want to see the full list of companies. Okay. That's on the sustainable side. On the financial side, you want to ask them about compensation. And you want to ask them, what are the fees that I am paying? And I would ask your advisor, how much of that do you get? Right? Because they get a cut. They get, and it's, that's normal. And it is what it is. They're offering the advice. And so, but having the transparency around the fees is, I think, so critical. And again, this acronym MER, and understanding that the average in Canada, about two to two and a quarter for mutual funds versus you know about a quarter to a half percent for ETFs. So it's fine if it's on the higher side, but I want you to know that it's on the higher side, right? But that's really the prep that you need to be doing. And then also give some thought about what, where your line in the sand is, right? If there are any red flags for you, if there are any companies that are thumbs down, like, you know, I don't know, but like Suncor, Enbridge, RBC, these are all companies with high ESG scores that are, you know, kind of considered more sustainable within their sector, is that going to cut it for you? <clears throat> so that's the kind of prep you want to do going in ahead of time. If someone is completely like direct investing, like, oh my God, no chance in hell, still sign up for a free consult with me. I can still help you. There are full service advisors that do this, right? There are other options. Um, if you've got more money, your options go up. If you've got more than 100K or 250K, you have lots and lots of options. And that, um, you know, if you've got, then, then, you know, I'm happy to provide you referrals to full service managers that are leaders in sustainability. If you're just getting started and you don't want to do it yourself, that's when I would nudge you towards robo advisors. So like, well, simple does have a fossil fuel free portfolio, right? Not as, you know, 
as clean or as cheap as doing it yourself, but you know, certainly, um, you know, much better than a standard investment. So there are so many options. I know it gets complicated. I know it gets confusing. That's why I say just the easiest thing, sign up for a free consultation with me. I'll talk to you for half an hour. If you don't want to do the DIY, that's fine. I don't care what you end up doing. It's only, you know, but to me, I just want you to, to get in a good place. Um, I'll be super transparent about if I have any referral agreements or things like that. You know, if if you want help with just the impact investing piece, you know, you can hire me to do just the community bonds side of things that really, you know, it's designed to be very, very flexible. But just know that you do have options. There are so many options. And that really it's just about figuring out what approach is best for you. And I'm kind of in a unique position where I just understand the whole ecosystem. I'm not a salesperson, so I'm never going to like, I've got my preferred, you know, DIY approach, but like, Hey, I recognize it's not for everyone. So really for me, it's about where you're at and you know, what, what steps do you need? What questions do you need answered? What research do you need in order to actually uh, move your money in the right direction? Thanks so much, Tim. We are at 131. I was going to maybe leave you with a closing question. For those who um, are new to Forward Kids, we'd love you to continue to come up. We're doing more learning sessions around this topic, and we're, we have one on bank regulation coming up, which is another area that we're, we're working on um, next week. And you can sign up. I'll put the link in the chat to um, learn more about this campaign and get more involved and just keep up to date with what we're working on. Um, but yeah, I, I think we had, we had one final question that was kind of sure. like, what do you think it will take to change the financial industry? Like what's Ugh. the, where are we off to and how do we, you know, we, we are a very fossil yeah. fuel oriented economy. And do you have any thoughts about what our role is and, and where maybe we can take this? Yeah. I mean, it's changing. So the good news is that it's changing, that I can't tell you the momentum that I'm seeing over the last, you know, I've been at this for 15 years now. It took a really long time. I would say 2020, my goodness, it just took off. It was interesting because last year it was sort of two steps forward, one step back. Last year was a bit of a step back, right? But what we need is continued momentum. We need more momentum. And so we need people talking about it. We need people doing it, taking the action of actually moving their money, asking. I saw someone, you know, saying, oh, my advisor said only three people have ever asked me. Well, you know, that's because only three people had the guts to ask them. A lot more people are thinking about this but are not actually doing it. So to me, what it takes, what it's gonna take is more financial literacy and people thinking about their money, being more intentional about it, and then asking these questions. And then once you start asking these questions, it's like, oh my goodness, now you have the information to actually take steps and take action. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is totally a momentum thing. This is a market-driven thing. And in terms of the ecosystem, the supply is there, but the demand has been slow that a lot of people are confused or need to like convince their partner to do it or are trying to convince their advisor to do it. And it's like, no, like this is your money. Just like, you know, understand the options are there. You don't need to sacrifice financial returns. We just need more momentum, more people doing it, more people talking about doing it. And that I'm convinced that, you know, really it's just, we're very close to a tipping point that if we can hit that tipping point, and I want to be clear, all the big money is all doing this. Canadian Pension Plan, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, all of these big organizations, they're all doing this. So my fear is that it is the little people that are going to kind of get left behind on this. So, you know, and then from there, it really is going to be a combination of the market plus government. The government action on this is so important. I mean, the budget came out, wasn't perfect, but my goodness, they are at least trying. There, there are some big things happening on the government side. And this is really what we need, as far as I'm concerned, is the, 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 the you know, private market in tandem with governments actually taking this stuff seriously. So by, you know, taking action with your money and taking action with your politics. You know, to me, those are the two biggest levers for change that we can be pulling to really, you know, accelerate, because it's happening, right? And it's gonna happen no matter what. The question is, is it gonna happen fast enough? So what we need to do is be, you know, pull on those levers to accelerate the transition so that it does happen fast enough. Totally, we're with you 100%. Yeah, I think, uh... You know, that's what Forward Kids is all about too, right? You you take something on, you share with your networks, and the more people know about this and the more people start taking action, obviously the more momentum we'll have. So this has been an amazing session and so much info. I'm sure we could talk for hours about this. <laughs> There's a lot to know. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, and thank you everyone for coming out. 
Really appreciate your questions and engagement. We'll be sharing the recording after this and some links to resources as well. Um, and stay tuned for more information about our campaign. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks all.